Welcome, dear viewer, to the Sierra Madre Casino, a resort far less luxurious than Frederick Sinclair perhaps ever intended. There's something about this place that makes one feel so... unwelcome. Like we're not supposed to be here. This isn't, however, a failure of the design. The casino is an interesting part of Dead Money because where the villa allowed the player a decent degree of exploration and survival horror even, the casino is more of a series of set pieces and story beats. The game is definitely becoming more focused at this point, however I don't really consider that a negative, at least not entirely. When it comes to dead money, it would be more than a little strange if the player could just go right back to the villa and explore to their heart's content. So I won't be giving it flack for choosing to have the remainder of the story occur within the casino. Though I do have to wonder why they chose not to have it to where, depending on the order the player chooses to partake in the quests, the scenarios would become more or less difficult. Kind of like my pitch to add consequences to the order the player does the quests in the villa. Maybe taking longer to get to Dean Domino would have him questioning the player's loyalty, or maybe have Christine's recovering the ability to speak, being dependent upon how late the player chooses to see her, or maybe Dog or God could become more unhinged the longer it takes the player to reach them. There are a lot of scenarios the writers and designers could have set up here to make things more interesting, so it's weird especially in a game like Fallout, particularly New Vegas, to see things made so deliberately and strictly linear. Now, with that said, the scenarios we get with these characters are pretty damn good. At the moment, the casino's sound systems are interfering with the connections between the bomb callers, and everyone is beginning to see opportunities to perhaps get what they've been wanting all this time. Dog sees the opportunity to not only end his own suffering, but to destroy the Sierra Madre. He intends to do this by burning the casino down via igniting the leaking gas within the kitchen. As you can imagine, God's kind of freaking out. Dean Domino sees the opportunity to finally claim the Sierra Madre as his own, and finally, after 200 years, steal the treasure stored deep within the casino. Christine's voice has finally recovered, but she now speaks with the voice of Vera Keys, and she doesn't intend to let Father Elijah walk away from the Sierra Madre. In order to breach the vault of the Sierra Madre, the courier needs to enable the sound system so they can recreate a sample of Vera Keys speaking the passcode to access the elevator. The reason the audio can't be accessed in the hotel lobby is because the white noise from the bomb callers are also causing problems within the Sierra Madre's already malfunctioning and less than optimally powered sound system, so the lobby terminal can't retrieve the ambient tracks. So between the loose ends and the heist of the century, the player has got their plate quite full. The stage is set, and it's time to deal with these characters. If... if other voice comes out, dog... Dog won't wake up. Dog doesn't want to sleep. Please don't make him. <sighs> Go to sleep. Good. Yes. Make him sleep. Please. The first encounter is with Dog and God, and he appears to be having a mental breakdown of sorts with Dog wanting to die free, but God wanting to live in control. Both want to be done with the Sierra Madre, but neither can agree on how to end things. The room is filled with leaking gas, and Dog will light a fire as soon as they detect the player, meaning the player will have to either stealthily repair all of the gas valves, or just do so very, very quickly. Since the valves are quite far from one another, I recommend the former, but I admit trying to shut them off really quickly does present something of a fun challenge. It's kind of like when you're trying to open the crawl space hatch in Resident Evil 7, where it feels like you're scrambling with shaky hands just trying to click the right button. You might be thinking to yourself that it would be clever to try and play the audio file of Father Elijah or the one of God so as to dissuade Dog, but that won't work this time. Dog is overwhelming God and will not listen to his former masters as he once did. God is fighting for his life, so he's not about to be swayed by this either. After fixing the valves, one of a few things will result from the dialogue that follows. With high enough skill checks, the player can talk Dog and God down. Failing that means putting Dog down once and for all. 
This, however, is by no means an easy enemy to take down. Dog and God are extremely tanky and hit like a truck, meaning the courier will need to make use of the environment to maintain a distance between themselves and the deranged nightkin. If you're running a melee build, good fucking luck. If the player kills Dog, they'll have a limited amount of time to escape the area before their bomb calls. This also applies to all subsequent encounters that result in a companion dying. However, there are multiple instances where the nightkin can survive. In fact, there's one ending per personality, making for a total of three. You might be thinking, wait a minute, there's only two personalities, but one of the endings allows the courier to basically become Dog and God's marriage counselor, convincing the two personalities to look into one another and become whole once again. This leads to a rebirth of a long dormant but complete persona, meaning the Nightkin will no longer understand who the courier or anyone else here is, let alone why they're here in the first place. He does seem like a reasonable person though, and the courier advises the Nightkin to rest and mend his wounds, but also to be sure to get the hell out of Dodge. It's a really cool conclusion to his character arc and honestly, I'd really love to see him in future content if at all possible. After escaping the kitchen, you'll notice that ghost people have infiltrated the casino lobby. At the start of the casino section, they were banging on the front entrance, but now they've gotten in. The player is still locked from leaving the casino though, which is kind of weird. You'd think they'd set it up to where Elijah would kill you for trying to leave, you know, like he does if you try to leave through the villa's front gate, but no. It's funny too because, hell, give me a secret ending where if I try to open it three times, the courier is swarmed by ghost people and I get some funny little death animation like in the first Resident Evil game. It's funny too because he even says he'll kill you if you try to leave, but unlike in the villa's front gate, he just won't. It's a little weird. Definitely a nitpick, but you gotta admit, it's kinda weird. The casino entryway is locked for the courier, but no longer for the ghost people. Either that or they got in some other way, but considering how state of the art this place is, and the the fact they've never gotten in until now, I'm inclined to doubt that. Plus, we're never presented with an alternative as to how they got in in the first place, so what else am I supposed to think exactly? This is also the only room in the casino that the ghost people will appear, and this is kind of a bizarre design choice to me. Earlier on in the villa, when setting up Dean Domino's part in the gala event, one of the paths we can take involves setting up security holograms to defend Dean Domino from the ghost people. Both Dean and Christine's encounters within the casino involve security security holograms, so how cool would it be to have been able to run the risk of using the security holograms, which would also attack the courier, against the ghost people? You can even turn on a security hologram in the casino entrance, but it's just not enough. It's kind of a shame we never got a proper encounter using both the holograms and the ghost people. They even designed the ghost people to behave a certain way when dealing with the holograms. Hell, imagine the ghost people being smart enough to actually try and flee from the holograms, and how cool it would be to watch the holograms seek them out as you try to make your escape. Something like that would have gone a very long way in making the Dead Money experience even more memorable to individual players. Not that it isn't already, but there was definitely potential for more. Finally, a friendly face. Hey, partner, up here. In a bit of a predicament here, had to duck backstage, take a powder. The audience is a little murderous tonight. After clearing out or sneaking past the ghost people, it's time to deal with Domino. Domino has set up in the back of the theater so as to avoid the security holograms, and in order to reach him, the player will have to avoid security holograms and speakers. One thing that confuses me though is why the holograms disappeared, why Dean didn't make a move when they did, and why they suddenly reappear after the courier is done talking to Domino from across the stage. I mean, I know the casino's power is fluctuating, but it's just a little bit too convenient. The theater itself is lined with speakers, but once you're done talking to Domino, the security holograms will spawn. There are two doors leading to the backstage area, and if the player paid attention during the dialogue with Dean, they'll know that the door to stage right is locked. If you didn't pay attention, there's a 50-50 chance of things going south really quick. Basically, the goal is to go backstage, get a recording of Dean Domino, and bring it to the theater projector to play it, which will disable the security holograms by turning them into a crowd for the performance. 
likely some showy crap that Sinclair had planned for the opening night of the casino. Navigating this area is not exactly a walk in the park though, thanks to the backstage area being so cramped and littered with speakers and radios. There are even small pockets of cloud, meaning there is very little room for error. The hall also has several turns, meaning every move needs to be executed with some proficiency. Thankfully, radios can always be disabled, and all of the speakers back here can be destroyed, meaning the player can freely navigate the backstage area once they overcome the various hazards. Which is worth doing because there is some good loot to find. Nothing crazy, but helpful items all the same, like Dean Domino's secret weapons stash in his room, or Vera's chems. It can also be nerve-wracking to have to go back out of the theater, running past the security holograms to reach the projector. Like I've said, these things can kill the player extremely quickly, typically after just a couple of zaps from their beams, even on the lower difficulties. Considering how many holograms there are, this leaves very little room for error. Thankfully, the holograms are somewhat slow to attack initially, and they can even be disabled. Thing is though, without a high enough repair skill, the only way to disable them is to completely destroy the devices that generate them. However, smashing one means the remaining holograms will instantly become hostile, meaning that momentary reprieve before they attack will no longer be granted to the player. So unless the player works to figure out where all of the hologram devices are, and these things are pretty well hidden, this would be an extremely risky approach to take. It's really impressive just how much Obsidian was capable of doing with a handful of radios and a couple of holograms. Like I said before, I do wish that we could have gotten some proper Ghost People v Hologram encounters, but what we got is still really good for the most part, at least by New Vegas standards. After disabling the holograms, it's time to have a chat with Dean. Whilst exploring the backstage area, the player might have stumbled across the blackmail tapes regarding him and Vera. Funny enough, when the player needs to go backstage, Dean is noticeably uncomfortable with the courier going through his own room. Bringing this up will reveal quite a bit of information regarding Dean and how he's connected to the Sierra Madre. As it turns out, Dean was planning to use Vera to pull a heist on the casino, leaving Sinclair bankrupt and making off with his fortune. When asked why he would do this, the sheer fragility of this man's ego comes into full view. He thought that Sinclair thought he was better than Dean Domino, and the Sierra Madre was a personal insult. What a fucking bitch. I love him. I'll go into more detail regarding the history of the Sierra Madre in a later video, but it still doesn't fail to blow me away just how petty Dean is. This man's head was so far up his own ass that he was willing to sit around in the villa and survive for over two centuries just so he could rob a dead man that he felt had insulted him by building a resort. Not only that, but he used Vera and her chem addiction as leverage to get in. Oh, and as it turns out, it was Dean that shoved Christine into the auto dock, planning to use her in his own heist on the Sierra Madre. What a piece of work. Much like Dog and God, Dean will either side with or against the courier at the end of the encounter, and there are a number of factors that play into this encounter and how Dean will ultimately behave towards the courier. You see, Dean, if you couldn't tell, has an extremely fragile ego. If the player let it slip when they first met that they had the upper hand on him, this would permanently affect his ability to trust the courier. The player needs to have cooperated with Dean, gone along with exactly what he has said, all just so that Dean will be comfortable with siding with the courier. And if he does side with the courier, great, the player can just walk right out. However, if the player was a big ol' meanie head, talking down to Dean or threatening to break his legs to keep him in the spot for the gala, he won't be quite as enthusiastic to let the courier go. In fact, he'll want the courier dead. Remember, this guy has been waiting for over two centuries to get the treasure of the Sierra Madre. He's not above killing you if that's what it takes. If Dean is killed, that means the player will have to be able to get out as quick as possible. On a completely random note, there's also this door that, I always seem to forget, opens towards the theater, leading me to sometimes get stuck due to my own incompetence, and this has led to some pretty funny moments of panic. It's never screwed me over though, just an inconvenience at worst. Overall, this was a really well done section of the casino. Begin again. And last, but probably not least, is Christine. 
Upon taking the elevator to the suites, the player will have to navigate a labyrinth of rooms, sometimes moving between the rooms through the broken down walls. It's a very well designed area that feels like a hotel would. The hallways are kind of cramped and the rooms themselves are very standard. The decor is very lavish, but despite its preservation, the two centuries of aging show. The center of the floor is host to a kitchen and storage area where the player can find a host of useful items as well as a workbench to craft some goodies. There's some cloud littered throughout random spots of the hall, but it's hardly the greatest threat. The real danger comes from the holograms. This time, the holograms take on the appearance of one Vera Keys, speaking on a loop and repeating the last recorded words of the once famous starlet. It's really creepy, especially when they detect you and go into their attack mode. They just keep going with this audio loop and it's unnerving to say the least. However, something doesn't make sense to me. Why and how do the holograms take on the appearance of people that were in the Sierra Madre? It's established that they do and the story runs with it, but I still don't get how it actually works. I mean, I guess the holograms need some kind of visual basis. I don't know. This one's really weird to me, but I am willing to chalk it up as just being one of those unknowable mysteries of the technology behind the Sierra Madre. It's not a plot hole or anything. I just don't get how it actually works on a mechanical level. Makes for some good moments though. This area concludes with the courier rendezvousing with Christine. Christine's voice has been permanently altered by the autodoc to resemble that of Vera Keys. Christine is a lot more transparent here than any other character in the Sierra Madre. If you've pissed her off, you'll know it right off the bat. She'll call you out and hold nothing back. If you've been nothing but friendly towards her, then she'll speak to you with a sort of warmness that is honestly very much needed in this hell. There aren't any skill checks to pass here, the player simply has to face the consequences of their decisions. And I really like that. If the courier had been hostile and conniving towards Christine, she'll attack once the dialogue is concluded. If the player's been friendly towards Christine, she'll help with accessing the vault, speaking the passcode herself and unlocking the elevator to the vault. However, the courier will need to talk her down from trying to kill Elijah, and although I've had issues with Christine's character up to this point, I think this is one of the most powerful story beats in Dead Money. Christine has been trailing Elijah for a very long time. She encountered him once at the Big Empty, but Elijah trapped her in a medical testing facility, connected to a machine that performed some kind of operation that damaged her brain to the point that she could no longer write, hence why she wasn't simply writing notes to the player. However, Christine was eventually saved. In fact, it was by another courier, one who claimed to know what it's like to seek another person. Eventually, Christine found her way to the Sierra Madre, where she came across Dog, who placed a collar around her neck. It's never spelled out, but I imagine that it's around this point that Dean found her and shoved her into the auto dock. Dog's struggle as a character was his inability to let go of his hunger and the desire to serve his master. On the flip side, God refused to let go of Dog in a desperate battle for control over their mind and body. For Dean Domino, the inability to let go of his petty disdain for Sinclair led to what many would consider a wasted 200 years. Christine's plight was her inability to let go of Elijah after all of the horrible things that he'd done, both to the Brotherhood as well as herself. She wants to get revenge more than anything in the world. She wants to see the Hand of Justice finally brought down on this incredibly evil person, and she finally has the perfect opportunity to see it happen. But with some persuading, the Courier convinces Christine to let go and let them deal with Elijah. Either that or they kill her themselves. Fucking evil bastard. The only thing left to do now is take the elevator down into the vault of the Sierra Madre. And this is where the finale of the story will take place. And that's the casino. This section of Dead Money definitely has some issues, but overall I think it's a mostly well-constructed level with some tremendous character work. As for what lies ahead, we will finally get to see what it is that lies within the vault the very heart of the Sierra Madre. I'll see you all there.